24 Sea Divers. It is January 12th, 2021. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you guys supporting us in 2020 with our Facebook Live events. And we have quite the lineup for 2021 for Facebook Live. And we are going to start our first one tonight here with Dr. Beth Brady from the uh, Serenity International. Do I say that right? Serenity? Serenian. Serenian <laughs> International. <laughs> um, but before we uh, let her get started, let's go ahead and check in and see how everyone's doing. Everybody have a good holiday season. Everyone made it through the new year. Say hello to us and give us a thumbs up. Give us a smiley face or a heart emoji. Let us know that you like seeing these presentations. Also, let us know where you're listening in from. Give us a little hello and tell us where you're listening in from. Are you here in South Florida, in the state of Florida, somewhere in the US, somewhere out of the US? We wanna know. All right, so like we always do guys, we love that you guys participate in our Facebook Lives. So make sure that you're checking out our event tab in our website to make sure that you don't miss out on any of these things. Always register. And the reason why you wanna register is because we're always giving away free things. So tonight, we're gonna raffle off a $50 gift card to 4C to somebody who has registered. And the only way you can get in that registration is to go to our event tab, go to the Eventbrite, and go ahead and register your name and your email address, and we'll put you in our random name picker. And you will see at the end of this presentation who the winner is. You have until 7 p.m. to register, all right? So we are keeping it open until 7 p.m. So all you guys who haven't registered yet, like I said, go to www.forsashi.com, go to the event tab, and then find tonight's event and click there and you should be able to do the rest. Thank you guys. Oh, look at everyone saying hello. Beth, isn't that I nice? Know. Costa Rica, that's awesome. Wow, great. So thank you guys for tuning in. Again, give us those thumbs up, those happy faces or those heart emojis. Let us know that you are super happy about the topic we have tonight. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start off by introducing our guest presenter, uh, Dr. Beth Brady. And uh, she's going to be talking to you guys about manatees and dugons. And the reason why I started uh, this presentation for January is because right now you can go up into the Crystal River area. And if you're interested in meeting a manatee up close in the water, it's the only place where it's legal to get in the water and swim with manatees with the tour operators. So if you are interested in any of these uh, types of adventures, give us a call at 4C and we'll give you some more information. Or you can write to info at 4 ecom and we can point you in the right direction. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Beth take over and I'm gonna be on board. If you guys have any questions, write them out and we will get to those um, a little bit later. So Beth, go ahead. All right, pull up my PowerPoint for me please. I do greatly appreciate it. All right. So hold on one second. Let Oops. me let me get out of the screen here. <laughs> They're gonna okay. put me in the screen. There we go. All right, sounds great. All right. So yeah, just give you just a little bit of information about me. I have been studying manatees since back in 2007, which is well, we're almost going on uh, what 13 years now. So I started off at Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in St. Petersburg, Florida. I did a photo ID work. And there I knew that manatees made vocalizations, but I didn't know a whole lot about them. So I decided I wanted to do further work. So from there, I went, first I went to Nova Southeastern University. Uh, I looked, started doing um, some acoustic work there. And then I finally finished my PhD just this past year. Yay, me. Uh, it, it this past year, and my work there focused on uh, the sounds of manatees, where I've been all across uh, the state of Florida and even been to Mexico to do some of my research. And I will get into my research just a little bit later. But let's start talking about Cyrenians in general. And it's interesting to note that Cyrenians have been around for over 50 million years. So when you think about that, you think about humans, they've been on this planet for about 6 million years, right? So uh, Cyrenian species have been around for a very long time. But why the name Cyrenian? 
So it's interesting, back in the day, sailors once mistook mermaids or manatees for mermaids. So if you think of mermaid as the siren of the sea, and that's where they came up with the scientific name, Sirenia, right? So where do we have Sirenians, right? So most people don't know that there's multiple different species of Sirenians. You have the West Indian manatee, which composes the Florida population, and you have the Antillean manatee, which goes into uh, South America, um, and the Dominican Republic and areas of that sort. You also have the Amazonian manatee, which is in the fresh waters of Peru. You have the African manatee, it's off the east coast of Africa. And you have the dugong species, which covers over 40 different countries, right? So let's talk about a little bit of these species in general. Uh, the West Indian manatee, they are subspecies, right? So when you see these animals, and I have images on the top is a West Indian manatee in the bottom image, is a Antillean manatee. And if you looked at these two species, you would look like they don't really look very different from one another. And they're not very different. If you look at them physically, it's hard to tell the difference between the two, but they do have some genetic differentiation between them. Now we're gonna look at the Amazonian manatee. And the Amazonian manatee is one of the smallest manatees. And if you look at these images side by side, you can see some definite differences between these two species. Now, the Amazonian manatee tends to have white patches on their belly. They live in fresh water. And the interesting thing, manatees have fingernails, but the Amazonian manatee does not have fingernails like the Florida and the Antillean manatee does. Like I said, they are the smallest of the manatee species. We also know that there are hybrids. So a cross between the Amazonian and the West in, uh, Indian manatee. And this is a paper done recently by Camilla uh, Lima et al. that shows there are some genetic hybrids and a crossover between the Amazonian and the West Indian manatee species. There's a crossover or a hybrid zone in uh, French Guyana where these two species are mixing. We have a hybrid between the two species. So then we have the African manatee, right? So if you look at the African manatee and you have the African manatee on the left and your West Indian manatee on the right. Now, if you look at these two species, again, you're not seeing a whole lot of differences between the two, but there are some slight differences. So the West, uh, the African manatee has slightly different eyes and a slightly more downward facing snout. Last but not least, we have the dugong. And the interesting fact about dugongs is they used to be over in our area many years ago, and unfortunately they went extinct. I'm gonna tell you why they went extinct, but currently they're over in the Indo-Pacific and they span over 40 different countries. So let's look at dugongs, right? So again, you have your West Indian manatee on the left, you have a dugong on the right. And when you look at these two, they look distinctly different from one another, right? The manatee has a more paddle-shaped tail, the dugong has a fluke, similar to a dolphin, the dugong has a more downward facing snout. And interestingly enough, they also do not have fingers on their flippers like the Florida manatee does. So when you look at the skulls of these guys, you can definitely see the differentiation between the two, right? So the dugong is on the left and the West Indian manatee is on the right. The du dugong with a more downward facing snout. So what does this mean? So a dugong, uh, where manatees can eat anywhere in the water column, they can eat the surface, they can eat either in the middle or below. Dugongs only feed on the bottom uh, where the sediment is in the seagrasses, right? So they can't feed up at the top of the water if there's a, a, a plant debris at the surface. They're only feeding on the bottom. And when they do this, they're pulling out the whole plant and they're shaking it and they're eating the whole plant itself, right? And interestingly enough, there's been some research done on what they leave what's called feeding trails. So you know where a dugong has been. Uh, if you heard of the Egyptian dugong, which is done by some great work by Ahmed Shaki, he actually measures the size of these feeding trails that are left by dugongs. And you can tell by the size of the feeding trails, whether or not it was made by an adult or a juvenile, meaning the juvenile is going to have a much shorter feeding trail and the larger adult is going to have a much larger or wider feeding trail. So then again, we also need to look at the differences in the skulls between dugongs and manatees. And if you look, we have a dugong on the right and a, man a manatee on the left. And you can see there's a huge difference here in their dentition, right? So manatees have what we call marching molars, meaning they're replacing their teeth. As they get worn down, they're continually replacing their teeth. This is one of the reason reasons why dugongs went extinct in our era. 
They did not replace their teeth continuously. Their teeth ground down. Unfortunately, they went extinct during this era because there was an uplifting uh, of and a lot more silt added to the area and the dugongs were unable to acclimate or adapt to that uh, situation. So unfortunately they went extinct in this area, but they do do quite all right over in the Indo-Pacific. Anyway, so we they are related to um, um, entities and dugongs are related to elephants. And there's an interesting feature about dugongs which shows that they are related to the elephant, which is their tusks. Now dugongs have tusks, right? But they're not as long as an elephant, right? They're quite short. You probably won't be able to see them with the naked eye. Males tend to have the tusks and grow the tusks, and sometimes the older females do as well. As you can see, these tusks here, um, they're rather short, maybe about, uh, let's see, a couple of inches long at most. But yeah, dugongs have tusks, right? So another interesting thing about the anatomy of a manatee is when you look at their brains, this is an image of a manatee brain, and they're about the size of a grapefruit. So the first thing you might notice about the manatee brain is it's smooth, right? And we call this lacinophilic. So higher uh, social order animals like dolphins and whales tend to have fissures in their brains. Uh, even humans, we have fissures in our brains, which are supposed to be associated with a higher level of intelligence. But do you think manatees are dumb? Well, I definitely don't, because manatees have phenomenal memories, right? They're like elephants. Elephants never forget. Manatees do have excellent memories. How do they remember where to, they, where to go for their warm water refuge every year? Some of these animals have traveled rather far. We've, uh, they've, they put tags on animals and found that they've gone from Crystal River all the way to the Bahamas. How do they remember how to get back, right? So they have excellent memories. You can also see by their brain, their visual cortex is rather small. So does that mean manatees don't see very well? Well, they do they have the ability to see colors. They can see blues and greens. They even like when I use a yellow buoy, they definitely are drawn to that. But they don't have really fine visual acuity, right? So they can probably see large objects, but they can't really have that spatial resolution that you and I have to see fine scale. Um, and most of the time they are in turbid water. So vision isn't as important to them. The auditory region is quite large, and we'll get into that in a minute. And their somatic sensory region is also large as well. So when we think about sensory, this is a great picture by uh, Carol Grant. They have a lot of vibrissae or whiskers on their face and on their back. And these vibrissae are thought that they could probably detect changes in currents, detect changes in temperature, and potentially even detect other animals depending on the change in water particle motion. So like I said, that auditory region is rather huge. And we do know that manatees produce sound. This uh, image on the right is from a colleague of ours who actually located the where manatees make their sounds from. And they found that they produce the sounds from vocal folds in the throat area. And what I'm showing you on the left is a graphic representation of sound or something called a spectrogram. And those three images are just some examples of the types of vocalizations that manatees make. And I'll go into a little bit more detail just a little bit later in the presentation about the different types of sounds that manatees make. So we also know that manatees are unique in that they have six cervical vertebrae. So most animals, except for sloths, have seven. So what does this mean for manatees? So we probably, we always like to say uh, manatees can say yes, but they can't say no. So when manatees move their bodies, they have to turn all the way from side to side to be able to do something because they don't have the uh, flexibility to turn their heads from side to side to say the word no. Another interesting thing is about their bones, right? So this is a rib bone of a manatee and they're rather heavy, right? They're very dense. There's no bone marrow in these bones. So they tend to be quite heavy and they actually act as a weight ballast, so to speak. We, we like to say for every four C scuba members, they act like a weight belt to help keep the manatee down in the water. So here's a graphic image of the anatomy of a manatee. You can see they have approximately, uh, let's see, I think it's 16 to 18 uh, uh, ribs that go along. And so their, their lungs are also three quarters of the length of their body. So those lungs help to keep them inflated and up in the water column. And those ribs kind of help sink them down so they can go under the surface to uh, grab their food. So interesting thing about the manatee flipper, this is the skeletal uh, 
part of a Manatee flipper, right? So, so you can see that it actually looks extremely similar to the human hand. Another interesting fact about manatees. Another interesting thing is they used to walk on land, right? 50 million years ago, they were primarily in more of like similar to like a hippo where they spent most of their, some of their time on land and some of their time on water. And they eventually uh, evolved to go to the water. So what I'm showing you here in the left is what remains of their pelvis, right? So animals that walk on land are gonna have a pelvic region to help support their weight. But this animal, this is what remains of their pelvis. They have two types of uh, pelvic remnant, vestigial bones is what they're called. And there's actually differences between these bones between male and female. If you look over to right, what I have the boxes there, the male is what I'm showing you in the picture to the left that distinguishes the male. That's what the vestigial pelvic bone looks like in the male. And on the right hand side, you see what a vestigial bone would look like for a female. So you can distinguish a male and female between the vestigial pelvic bones. So how do we study manatees? And this is what I went into a little bit. So it's interesting that in the United States, um, we it's a little bit easier, just a little bit easier to study manatees as they tend to aggregate in these warm water refuges, right? So it doesn't really in the case in many of these other areas, right? They're tropical areas. Manatees don't need to migrate to warm water refuges. So during the summertime, if you've ever been around the summer, you're like, where do you go to see manatees? It's difficult to see manatees during the summertime, but we know where they go in the wintertime, right? So it's a lot more difficult to uh, study some of these other species. And a lot of these other species, we really have very limited information about their population size, right? But anyway, some of the ways, I'm gonna give you some of the ways in which we study manatees. You may be very familiar with photo identification using scars to identify animals. This can give you an indication of animals over time. This can be an indication of how they use certain habitats. They also can do this with dugongs. And this is again by our colleague, uh, Ahmed Shaki over in Egypt, who's doing some great work over there. What he's showing you is how they use some of the scars and some dugongs may fight and use their tusks to fight one another, uh, potentially. And so they do sometimes get scarring. And some of those scarring that they get can be used to identify individuals. So this dugong MEG15 was identified in 2014. And using those specific scar patterns, again, they were identified in 2020. Uh, the animal in your upper right is showing you with the red arrows uh, where some of those scars were found on that individual. So another methodology that we use a lot in the States is tagging individuals. So the image to the left is from Florida Fish and Wildlife. They use a GPS tag. They attach it to the individual and they can follow and track their movements. This is how they determine that some of these animals went from uh, Crystal River to the Bahamas. I believe there was one animal that went uh, from Florida to Massachusetts a couple of years in a row. And there's also one I believe that went to Cuba and in the Bahamas as well. So they travel very long distances. They also use these tags on orphan calves. So you get a lot of orphan calves um, and they come into rehab facilities for approximately two to three years until they reach a certain length, and then they get released. Um, but what they do is a soft release, meaning sometimes these animals, when they come in as orphans or a small calf, they haven't learned from their moms where the warm water refuges are. So there's a group called Manatee Rehab Partnership that actually monitors these animals. And so they put tags on these animals and monitor them for about a year or so, I believe, just to make sure that these calves are being manatees. Another way that researchers uh, do to study names is the synoptic surveys, which are quite popular and which we do in Florida. So what they used to do is they would fly over the warm water refuge areas a couple of days where they all kind of did it together synchronously in a couple of days, usually following uh, a uh, very uh, cold front, right? And they count the populations on the East Coast and the West Coast. And what I'm showing you here on the right-hand side are just the numbers, the total numbers we have from the past couple of years. They haven't updated uh, the information for 2020 yet. But what they're showing you, what's interesting to note is these numbers don't accurately reflect exactly what the population is. These are the minimum estimates. Because even though animals might be in these warm water refuges, not all of them are in the warm water refuges. So we actually estimate there's around seven to 10,000 animals. So even though that number is low for 2019, 5,733, that doesn't necessarily reflect the number of animals that we currently have in the population. 
And just I just read uh, today, they just changed their observation methods. So they're going to include some of these passive thermal refuges. They're going to fly at least over a week and do multiple surveys. So they're going to give you a more accurate estimation of the population in Florida. So like I said, in other areas, such as the Amazon and, and, and Tilia manatees and dugongs, they live in turbid waters. And sometimes it's really difficult to see them. So we have to use other methodologies to determine where these animals are and what they're doing. So another method that they use is side scan sonar. So it's kind of equivalent to your fish finding device, right? So it sends a side scan sonar, sends out a beam and basically reflects back an image to you. So Kind of what I'm showing in the upper slide and the lower slide is showing you how it's um, reflecting back an image of a manatee and this work has been done uh, some of this work that I took this from is uh, Daniel Gonzalez who's doing a lot of work aside scan, scan sonars um, I believe it's been done in the Amazon and with Antillian manatees but it's another way uh, to virtually and help find these animals and they can use to determine group size how many animals are there how they're potentially using their habitat if they're mom calf pairs, um, and just to find other topographic regions of the area to determine, like, is it a is a seagrass that is something where a manatee would want to go to? So this is another way, and this is a video from my good friend Eric Angel Ramos. This is drone video, so where you're starting to use drones uh, to capture what animals are doing. This is used a lot of other marine mammals, as well, but it's also with used with manatees. So aerial surveys are quite expensive, so you can use drones to focal follow animals. Uh, they've also been using them to take pictures from the drones to identify scar patterns. Uh, they can also use it to determine uh, if an animal is healthy or not, to be able to look at the body itself and do what we call morphometrics. So this is another slightly non-invasive way to monitor the species. Um, you see a lot of drone work on uh, the social media, uh, what researchers have to be are heavily permitted to be able to do drone work. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of effort that goes into getting those permits to do a lot of uh, drone work that we do here. Last but not least, we do uh, genetic testing. So this is really fascinating work. A lot of this has been done by uh, the United States Geological Survey. So they actually take DNA samples from the water, right? They get the sample of water and they can detect DNA of manatees from that water sample. And I can give you a lot of really good information, again, about where manatees are, um, especially in places where it's very difficult to see them or where they aggregate in large numbers. So again, I'm gonna go back to, and this is where I'm gonna get to the auditory region and sound, which is what I am focusing on, what my research involves. It's another technology that we can use to identify important manatee habitat or see what's going on with the animals. So I do a lot of acoustics, which is underwater sound, and I use an underwater microphone or a hydrophone to do my work, and there's some images of that. Uh, the image in the lower right-hand corner is called a D-tag. It's something they use as a suction cup to attach to individual animals, and that can also get their vocalizations as well as others, as well as look at other parameters, such as how far they dove or what kind of uh, temperature or salinity of the water that they were in. So let's talk briefly about manatee vocalizations and what would manatees have to talk about, right? So you wanna know something, questions about your animal, what kind of sounds do they make and how do they use them? And by having this information, it kind of helps you to understand uh, how you can further conserve the species. So what would manatees have to talk about? So manatees have limited effects of predators, some anecdotal evidence of their having effects from alligators and sharks, but not really a whole lot to produce what be an alarm call. So an animal like a squirrel or a meerkat would produce an alarm call to alert the others around it to a predator presence. Their food source is stationary, right? Most of these, anim these animals eat uh, seagrasses. The African manatees and omnivore eat uh, fishes and other things. And, and, uh, Florida manatees have been known to eat some tunicates and barnacles as well. But for the most part, like I said, their food source is stationary. So they're not competing or cooperatively foraging for food. They're not known to be aggressive, although that has been somewhat debated. And we'll go into that into a minute. And they don't have long lasting social bonds. So the most prominent social bond in a manatee is the one and a half to two years of cow and calves. But we're actually going to start looking into that too, because we kind of think that manatees stay in these social groups of these very limited aggregations for a little bit longer than we think. 
So in my work, and this was published back in 2020, beginning of 2020, I discovered and looked at the types of vocalizations that manatees produced. And they produce five different types of vocalizations. The most common type that they produce is the squeak, which we see to the left. It's more of a tonal sound. The high squeak, which is a hill-shaped call. The squeal, which is a noisy sounding, has a lot of broadband noise in it. A squeak squeal, which is a combination of a squeak and a squeal, and a chirp. And it was great that I found all these, these call types, but then you have to ask yourself, well, how, do the, how does the animal use these sounds? Which of these are important to the animal? So for that, I had to do a lot of behavior analysis. And I went to a couple different sites around the state of Florida to gather my data. And what I found is that out of those five call types, manatees primarily use three call types, the high squeak, the squeak, and the squeal. So then we got to think about manatees and the call types they make. So this is a these three different calls that I'm showing you are different types of squeaks. So I want you to think about your cat or your dog for a minute. When your cat or dog barks or meows, you can tell by the way they bark or the way they meow if they want something different. They may growl when someone's out the door. They may bark when they're excited. And you can probably tell the differences between the two as their owner, right, and how, how they're vocalizing. So the same kind of thing with manatees. Just manatees don't live in these large social groups, so they're not going to need a whole lot of vocalization to interact with each other. But what they might do is change the structure of their call or change how they make the call type itself, just like your dog would, to get across their meaning, right? And this is what we think that they're doing. So to do this, I had to look at a couple of different behaviors. So what behaviors do you look at? What do manatees do? Manatees do a lot of resting, and this is from Fort Pierce. Uh, in a passive thermal refuge. So during the winter months, manatees don't tolerate waters less than 68 degrees. So they're going to go in these warm water refuges, right? So, and when it's really nice and sunny out, they like to bask at the surface, but they also like to uh, they'll rest in sometimes smaller groups. And then sometimes they get really comfortable and they'll lay on their backs. So when you look at the vocalizations that manatees produce when they're resting, we notice that, yeah, they like to rest a lot in groups too, that their vocalizations tend to be more tonal. So for example, it means they're more relaxed or at rest. An animal that is excited may have more modulation or more noise in their calls. Animals that are relaxed may tend to be more tonal or more flat. So then I also looked at feeding and hopefully this will play it and oops. And then hopefully you hear the sounds of manatees chewing. So again, because when manatees are feeding, they're not cooperatively foraging, they're not competing for food. So the call types they may depend tended to be more flat and more tall, probably indicating a lower state of arousal. Then we have what we call manatees cavorting or playing. Let's look at a video of that. <laughs> We do a lot of this <laughs> during the summer months. This tends to mimic uh, mating behavior. We do a lot of play. We kind of grab and bustle and, and, and roll around with one another. So this is a more heightened state, right? Manatees are engaged in a more social behavior. So their call types were one. They were more modulated, right? Indicating probably a higher state of arousal. And they're also a lot noisy, right? So in other animals, right, these noisy calls can be an indication of aggression or possibly it could also indicate a higher state of arousal. So elephants, for example, the closest living relative to the manatee, they make noisy trumpet sounds when they're very excited and when they're playing with other elephants. So we're not quite sure if it is aggression. There has been some isolated instances in the literature of manatees being aggressive towards other manatees, but these have mostly been in captive environments. Uh, so we think that maybe this is quite possible that they're exhibiting a more higher state of arousal. Last but, oops. Last but not least, we have stress-induced vocalization. So up in Crystal River, through the United States Geological Service of Running a Project, they actually, actually capture manatees every year to do health assessments on them, just to do a checkup to see how the population is doing. And when I was there, I actually recorded the manatees while they're being captured. You can see me all the way there on the far right with my yellow buoy recording the manatees after they're being captured, right? So 
What do you think these calls might look like? And the interesting thing is these calls are the most modulated out of the four categories that I found. And they're also a lot longer in duration than any of the other behaviors that I looked at. So what this is telling us is manatees make very few call types and they change the structure of the sound depending on the behavior that they're engaged in. Another thing that we're looking at along with some other colleagues is calves. So manatee calves stay with their moms for about one and a half to two years in the wild. And it's presumably thought that they don't really need to be with them after about a year. They can be on their own, but they tend to stay with them to learn where those warm water refuges are. And twins, by the way, are, are quite rare in the species, but it, but it does happen. So you would make sense that if you have offspring, you want to stay in contact with your offspring. And some of the work that I did built upon the, uh, the work of a previous researcher named Renata Suzu Lima. And so just think about my voice is different from your voice, is different from Cole's voice. We all have individuality in our voices. And the same thing goes for a manatee, right? We have different, uh, we have different, ways, uh, different ways of speaking, different tones to our voice because we have different morphology of our vocal tract, right? Slightly different for everyone. And again, this is the same for manatees. So we found that manatees are slightly different between individuals, which may help mom recognize her calf from the other calves, particularly if they're in a large aggregation. So we also looked at size of manatees, and, and my work looked at this just a little bit. So I studied some animals in the wild and also in captive environments. So remember we went back to that hill shape called the high squeak. So when we looked at these younger calves or smaller calves, we found that they tended to have a more hill-shaped structure across all the smaller calves. When I looked at larger calves, like these are calves that are around 150 centimeters and closer to 200 centimeters, or they're around a year of age, that hill shape starts to flatten out and become a more adult-like squeak. So this is important to note, right? So, and we still need to do a lot more research on this. And we're actually working on um, with a bunch of other colleagues in the Amazon and to compare this across species. Because we do seem to think that this hill shaped call is similar from Antillian and Amazonian and, and the Florida manatees. And we do think this hill shape flattens out. So this is a really good information to have, right? If you're going out and you don't know where your animals are, one, if you put a hydrophone in the water, and calves tend to be three to four times more vocal because they're trying to find mom, you might see some of those calls. And one, you'll know if you have a calf. You know, two, if they're using the area, right? Some of these areas that might be in these regions might be important for calf births or safe places for them to go, right? So that is the end of my chat. And I think I'm going to let Nicole take over and I'm happy, happy to answer your questions. And I think that's a good slide that I end up with my favorite picture. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so if you have any questions, make sure that you're typing them in the comments section. Um, so they wanted to know, how can you tell the age of a manatee? The age of a manatee. So one way to do it is unfortunately after, after death, they can use the ears and just like the rings of a, of a tree, you can look at the rings of the ears in, in a ear bone and determine the age of a manatee. Otherwise, it's rather difficult to do. So they divide them into calves, subadults, and adults. So calves are usually relatively easy to distinguish. You can see them; they're kind of the tiny ones are like easier to uh, discern as calves. The larger ones, the subadults, are like those medium sizes, right? And sometimes they're really difficult to distinguish from the very large animals. The, the larger adults can reach up to what's it, like three thousand pounds. I think they get rather large, and the females tend to be larger than the uh, males, which is interesting. So we have um, some people asking about the dugons. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that they wanted to know is, you know, probably not a good idea to introduce an invasive species like the lionfish into our area. So I'm not sure if this is the right thing, but people are asking, could you reintroduce, say, dugons that are actually over um, in the areas that they're still you know, alive and reintroduce them here in the Florida area. Could you actually do that without having a problem with the ecosystem? 
Well, I think part of the problem is why they went extinct here is because they don't replace their teeth. And a lot of the seagrasses here are silty. I think it might be rather difficult for them to survive over here. What they do over in the Indo-Pacific is they take up the whole plant and they shake it to get that silt off. Is it possible? I guess so. I, I don't really know. Um, but I think they're doing quite well over in the Indo-Pacific. Like I said, they span more countries, like 40 different countries, which is fascinating that they spend all that very large area and actually they're interesting like i said the, the dugongs in australia actually migrate too depending on the weather which some of the other species don't have to do so so we're still talking about dugongs they want to know um going back to the tusks that they had you talked mm -hmm. about how they're very similar to an elephant but um someone wants to know are they uh tusks like a narwhal mm. I'm not quite sure. I think it, horns in general are made from keratin, right? And I'm not sure if it's quite the same. It's almost like a, an enlarged tooth, so to speak. Um, so I'm not quite sure about that. But I think they would have a similar composition to uh, horns, I think. Yeah, probably. Probably, um, but not quite exactly the same use or function. Right. And do you know if there's any Dugon rescue centers um, that, you know, are over in the areas that they're located. You know, that's the fascinating thing is I have been trying to find a Dugong rescue center and I'm not quite sure why we don't know of any. I see very rarely they do find small Dugongs that have been orphaned in places such as Thailand and I believe, I want to say there's one that was just recently um, out, uh, seen through um, the, uh, uh, the uh, facility in the Puerto Rico. And I don't know why that is. I've asked and I can't quite find the answer, but there doesn't seem to be any rehab centers for dugongs, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, okay, so a lot of people are kind of confused. They're trying to figure out, they were surprised to see manatees in Lake Okeechobee. Um, hmm. Are they there? Do you know if, if that's a place that they hang out? Probably not frequently, because I think isn't that isn't, how do you, I guess there's a way to get in there, but they still have to get out. Yeah. <laughs> Some way, shape, or form. They tend to go through canals. So it's very rare for manatees to traverse the coastline from the east to west coast. Um, but it does happen. So, and they think, I think they went through the canals and lots. So it's, it's possible they went through there to get to the east to west coast. I would probably. Yeah, but they'd have to like take the directions on what the boats do because the locks they lock and then you have to so that'd yeah, be kind of hard all kinds of different areas. <laughs> um but they do want to know you know can they survive you know they they're in the salt water can they invite in the fresh water so they oh, go between yeah. the two they definitely go between the two so dugongs are completely marine right they're only in salt water uh, the Amazonia is purely fresh water and manatees can definitely go between both they need fresh water in order to survive so one of the places you might find manatees in your area if there's a freshwater outflow. And that actually brings up, um, it's something I shared during the presentation that FWC has um, a great website uh, page about how to observe manatees and respect the laws. And one of the things is, is you're definitely not supposed to feed a manatee and you're definitely not supposed to um, give them fresh water. So even though you on your boat dock and you want to throw that hose over the side, uh, it is frowned upon. You can get a fine. Do you know what that fine is? It's like $100,000 or something something along those lines. And they are looking. And if you even take photos or videos, the FWC actually comes through Facebook and tries to find people who are violating these laws. And you will get a knock on your door, and they'll ask you about it. So I've heard, I've heard people have been yeah, uh, fined for it. I think, uh, yeah, I'm not sure the exact number, but I mean, for the recent, we've seen the recent news is between anywhere for up to $100,000 for doing some of these uh, harassing and manatee, which is not a good idea. <laughs> um, so a lot of people asking, do manatees eat fish? <laughs> ah, so yeah, so here's the thing. So I met some people down in the Keys who they would throw their fish guts to them and manatees would definitely eat them. African manatees, yes, they've been known to steal fish out of nets. So do manatees eat them? They're opportunistic. If it's something there that they're gonna, they're gonna try it, yeah. It's not their normal food source and I don't think they're actually chasing fish, but if given the opportunity, I think they would eat it. They probably nibble on a carcass or something. I don't think they're chasing fish. Do the dugons eat um, fish or any I think they are. An, um, pretty certain that they eat uh, sea grasses. I'm not quite certain if they eat other um, opportunistically other things. 
probably as well, but they have to be on the bottom of the water column because their snout is so down with face. I'm not quite sure about that one. Okay. And since you're talking about dugons again, they want to know, um, you might have said in the presentation, but just for some people, how long ago did they go extinct here? Ooh, it's a good question. And one that I can't remember off the top of my head. I apologize. Um, Were they, do you sure. know, do you know, because I remember there used to be, there, there's a Hawaiian monk seal and they used to have a Caribbean monk seal and that one went extinct. So I wonder if they kind of went out at the same time. I'm not, not sure. quite sure. I know they went extinct. And then, forgive me, that's the one. Well, that's okay. We will look it up and we will type I will it in. Let the, you know. Yeah, I'm we'll type it in that. the comments section. <laughs> um, all right. And then another question was Have you ever seen? So, a lot of times, um, marine mammals will have like a pigmentation um, uh, display. So, like, you'll hear about that white killer whale or that mm -hmm. white humpback whale. Do you ever see a albino uh, manatee? You know, I've never seen or heard of an albino manatee ever. Um, one thing I did do is I had to distinguish animals from one another, particularly so animals, manatees will do bottom resting and bottom feeding. So I had to distinguish individuals by their barnacles or they had algae growth or they had different colorations. Um, so that way I could determine how long, whether or not they were feeding, bottom feeding or bottom resting. So if they're bottom resting, more than likely they're staying down for six minutes or more. If they're feeding, it's like less than five minutes that they tend to be bottom feeding. So I had to distinguish that in my work. So I had to look at individuals, and that's where they are slightly different. But I don't think there's any, I've never seen or heard of an albino manatee. <laughs> well, I do know that when you um, see them, some can have a little bit uh, a more wider pigmentation, not mm -hmm. white, but like a lighter versus right. some are a little bit darker. Correct. Especially our, our babies tend to be darker. I think they're a little bit lighter. Oh, they're a little bit lighter? Okay. I always tend to think they're a little Trying bit to remember. Coloration. It's been a while since I've seen a baby, baby. But yeah, they're, they're pretty tiny. <laughs> if you guys ever have a chance to look at YouTube videos and go look up uh, baby manatees that have been rescued and the way that they feed them is so cute. They turn them, like, on their backs and they, like, hold their little arms and then they give them their little baby bottles and it's so cute. Mm -hmm. So if you have a chance to look at um, how they rehab baby manatees, uh, go ahead and YouTube a cute video. Um, so obviously, I, I warned you that this was probably a topic that was going to come up because it's in the news. People want to know about the manatee with the Trump name scratched onto it. Um, will the skin remain scarred? So this is my personal opinion. I don't think that the animal was carved as is in a knife. It, it appears that it was scratched. The algae was scratched off. Will it remain scarred? I doubt it, but I, I can't say conclusively without following that animal for a period of time. But it doesn't look like it was carved into, as they're saying with the knife, it looks like it was scratched off. The algae is more than likely scratched off. And obviously there are people that are trying to get to the bottom of who maybe have done it. So, um, you know, that's a huge fine. That person will yes. be prosecuted. So that's complete harassment of the uh, manatee, which is a protected um you know, species here. Mm -hmm. So um, somebody wants to know, how do you get involved in uh, careers with manatee research and, um, and, uh, and taking care of them? Ah, so uh, if you go to our Facebook page, which I'm sure Nicole will be so kind to share at the end, we do show about manatee internships. There's some really good ones at Lowry Park Zoo. You want to go to some of the other rehab facilities in the area, namely the Jacksonville Zoo. You may want to volunteer your time at SeaWorld. Um, mm -hmm. They do some really excellent rehab with the with manatees there, as long with Miami Sea Aquarium, and I believe there are some in the Cincinnati uh, Zoo as well. Um, you want to go to school to get a degree is always helpful. Um, and then internships are a great way to get into the marine research, research field. Do as, as many internships as you can. It's also helpful to find ones that are paid, right, or will offset the cost of you going there, right? And also you want to look into a researcher who's doing something that you're interested in to make sure that you're following your dreams and your passion. Awesome. Okay. So another thing, too, um, maybe you can't get up to the uh, Crystal River area and you want to see manatees, you can actually go online to Manatee Lagoon. And it is a um, non-for-profit uh, facility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a non-for-profit facility up in the Riviera Beach area. 
And what they did is they um, put a center there and they have a live camera and you can go on there throughout the day. And if you're like, you know, I'm at work and I want to just see some manatees, you can go ahead and see that live camera and see if they are hanging out in Manatee Lagoon. And unfortunately, right now, Manatee Lagoon is normally open to the public, but because of COVID, uh, they have restricted people coming to the center. But hopefully sometime soon, they'll be able to open up and you guys can visit them there uh, if you're not able to get up to Crystal River. So there's also the Apollo Beach Power Plant uh, out of Tampa, and they have cameras up as well that you can actually go on and navigate. And they have huge aggregations of manatees. They have sometimes four or five hundred up in there. <laughs> a lot of animals up in there. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I think it's time for you guys to go on our on Facebook and make sure that you friend or you like the page. Um, what's the you, what's the full name of the page on Facebook? It's Sirenian International Supporting Manatee and Dugong Conservation. Awesome. So if you guys can go there, support them, local research. We always want to make sure that we know everything that's going on with Mantis since we love to hang out with them. And maybe if you're lucky, you'll see them diving at the Blue Heron Bridge. I know we have a few divers that uh, are on their dive on that snorkel trail and a manatee whizzes right by. So again, guys, the only place you can legally get in the water and do a manatee swim is up in the Crystal River area. Um, but here down in this area, you're not supposed to be swimming with them. Now, if they approach you, it's another thing, but you're not supposed to be actively trying to swim with manatees. So we just wanted to make sure you guys knew that. No, yeah, don't feed or, or try to pet a manatee. I know it's very difficult to try and refrain from doing so, but we try to not get them acclimated to, to humans because we want them to be manatees. So just um, one more question here, and um, yes. we just wanted, oh, someone saw Mike Green. You saw one on uh, at the bridge on New Year's Day. Woohoo! Um, so one more question here is, the population and the health of Florida manatees. Uh, if you could, if you could just give us um, where it is now. I mean, we've heard obviously all these different years, and with cold snaps and stuff like that. Where are we now with the population? So this was last year, and they said that. So, like I said, those estimates or that we're showing you through Florida Fish and Wildlife, and it might change because they didn't put up their 2020 numbers yet. The estimates are there. Their populations are steadily increasing which is a good thing. Are they still getting hit by boats? Yes. But when you hear the numbers about like red tide and things, and it's just actually a small percentage of what the population actually is. So with the, what we're getting from those health assessments of Crystal River, at least that population is doing really well and they're really healthy. Now, if the effects of climate change or whatever things going to happen in the future, you can't always predict, but it seems thus far that they're doing rather well and the population is doing steadily increasing. They're doing some great things up in Crystal Bay, doing a res restoration of eelgrass. So they're giving a lot of food for the animals to eat up there as well. So there's a lot of things going on up there as well. And so when it comes to FWC and the laws, are they on, um, is there any meetings that we need to be aware of as a community that needs to go up there and kind of rally and make sure they continue to do the, um, the laws and the supports with FWC? Because like sometimes with the Goliath groupers, they'll They'll do five years and then they'll put them back up on the list. And us as divers, we go in and we try and make sure that, you know, they stay protected. So is there something that we need to be aware of or watching? Um, I think Save the Manatee Club actually does a lot of that. They, if you go follow them in their Facebook page, they'll actually give what they call action events, I believe, or things that they promote and say, go here and let your voice ripple. They'll even write uh, a letter for you that you can just send off to uh, your uh, constituent or representative in your area so it's helpful in, in that aspect okay so guys you heard it here if you want to get more involved with uh learning about manatees helping with research and uh you know just helping the overall population go ahead and make sure that you're looking at um Beth's research and her uh following her on facebook yes. and on her website which i did put the link um there for you guys so you have it yeah, we're going to have a lot of research projects coming up. We're going to Mexico. We actually just partnered with uh, the Manatee Observation Education Center in Fort Pierce. So we're doing a lot of big things coming up in the next couple of months. Awesome. Okay, guys, thank you so much. And we're going to yeah. go ahead and do our live raffle. So, guys, I said I was raffling off a $50 gift card to 4C. 
We want you to come in. Maybe you buy your wetsuit so you can go up and uh, have a nice warm wetsuit and go hang out with some manatees in a wetsuit or maybe uh, use it for some other things like fins or a hood or some gloves just to keep you warm. Or we even have boat coats to keep you warm after you're done playing with manatees. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in our random name picker. Okay, there it is. I put everybody's name in our random name picker. There they all are. Okay, so the winner of our $50 gift card goes to... Let's see. Dawn Finn. Dawn, you are our winner. Yay, Dawn. Dawn, if you're listening, go ahead and give us a thumbs up or give us an emoji in the comment section. Let us know that you're here. And we are super excited to be able to give you that $50 gift card so you can use it here at 4C. Thank you, Dawn. And guys, again, thank you so much for always supporting 4C and always learning about the different things you can do here in South Florida to help the animals that you want to see when you go diving. So again, thank you, Dr. Uh, Beth Brady, for the great presentation. And you guys have a wonderful evening. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.